podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being. Being well. Some of the topics are addiction, fear, faith, self-compassion, relationships, codependency, emotional intelligence, and more. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. Something needs to change, but I'm not sure what. I don't feel like I'm growing anymore. This isn't the life that I imagined for myself. I just feel stuck. Sound familiar? Who you want to be, it's not out of reach. You could begin today. You can commit to change. Start where you are. Make a plan to move forward and take action to reinvent yourself. TheCreativeIndependent.com So let's talk about change, transformation, making it different, adjusting, shifting, evolving. This episode is about reinvention, reinventing yourself. And my guest is Sabin Prentice. Sabin Prentice Duncan is the owner of Fielding Books, where he writes fiction as Sabin Prentice. He's the author and co-author of six titles, including his latest novel, Compared to What? He's a husband, father, Detroit native, and as he likes to say, the creator of literary soul food. Dr. Duncan earned his Doctor of Philosophy and Educational Specialist degrees from Eastern Michigan University and his Master's and Bachelor's from Hampton University. To read Sabin's full biography, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Here is the interview with Sabin Prentice. In your own words, who is Sabin Prentice? Sabin Prentice is a lifelong learner, which has become somewhat cliche in our contemporary society. But I use it as a way to grow forward and a type of curiosity of understanding other people. And then uh, it kind of helps them understand me. And it kind of makes us seem all related in a way. Uh, one of the big things is uh, a few years ago I read Susan Cain's Quiet, The Power of Introverts in the World That Can't Stop Talking. And I felt like I was looking in the mirror. Uh, but I learned that, in, in addition to being an introvert, is very much connected to the fact that I have a hearing impairment. And this, this disability kind of forces me to hope that others are as accepting and accommodating for me. So I try to extend that initially. And it also helps me pay attention with a higher level of intensity, I suppose, so that I can really hear what the person is saying. And that empathy kind of shapes my personality. And as a dad, as a college administrator, as a brother, it shows up everywhere. Mm. That sounds really good to me. It triggers me to ask you a question before um, the other questions I have here, lots of them. What is the difference between empathy and compassion? Well, I want to start by saying, saying this may not be the dictionary <laughs> version, but this is the Saban Heart answer. <laughs> yes, I like that. <laughs> the Saban Heart answer is the empathy, is the understanding, the feeling, putting yourself in someone else's shoes and kind of seeing where they come from. But I, compassion might 
I put more action in there, and it is perhaps an act of empathy, an act of love, an act of understanding, and an act maybe generated in kindness, even if it's a form of misunderstanding, you can have a type of compassion. Again, this is the unofficial saving heart definition. The empathy might be the energy and the compassion may be the action. Thank you. Um, my official first question to you, it's about health. Do you have an unconventional definition for what is to be a healthy person? I believe it may be unconventional. I think most, maybe the common trigger response is one's physical health. I think as we grow, or as I talk about being a lifelong learner, I learn how my physical physical health is connected to my emotional, mental, financial, spiritual, and all of these things, they kind of play off of each other. And then this is a big gumbo of health overall, instead of just one dimension, just physical health. It makes a lot of sense. They call it, I think, holistic health. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense to me. Um, what is to reinvent oneself? I knew the word reinvention technically as a younger man. I would say that it the richest definition or example of it came through my appreciation of the musician Miles Davis. Uh, Miles Davis is one of the best trumpeteers ever. And just strictly speaking from his musical journey, and I'm not a musician, I'm not that technically sound, so I use generalized terms. He reinvented his sound multiple times in his career after having a big hit or a very celebrated record. So he had the birth of cool. And then some years later, he had kind of blue. Some years later, he had a uh, bitches brew. And these evolutions that match his growth as a man and as an artist, I saw in his story a type of way of, you know, extending our lives in new ways, not living the same life over and over. And so while it's all grounded, or in Miles Davis' case, it's grounded in his uh, technical expertise as a musician, his curiosity and work ethic show up as a way to help him grow in a new way. So like when I read Miles Davis' story as a template, then I take this reinvention. And so there are core principles that, are, that I'm born with, that I've learned, and in certain stages of life, certain dynamics, social dynamics, professional dynamics, I express them differently. And these this expressions reflect the human being that I am in that moment. So it was pretty, uh, I, at one point I was, uh, I served as an honors college director uh, of my alma mater, Hampton University. And I was fortunate to be in that position. I was handpicked by my mentor who picked me and then she passed. I uh, read my student work because I'm in the office with all our documents and our files. And at my core, I was the same person, but I would express things totally different. But so I think we ha we are born with some inherent values. There are some that we learn in our formative years, but our expression of them or our acts within them kind of change over time as we change. And our willingness to participate in that change lends itself to the reinvention. Yeah. Um, would you connect being open-minded and open-hearted to reinvention, reinventing ourselves? I'd provide an example of how I see it, uh, a type of illustration. And if you could imagine holding a quarter in a clenched fist, um, perhaps this is your last quarter. It's what you know. It's that with which you're familiar. Life, someone else cannot offer you a dollar until you open your palm and you're vulnerable to losing the quarter. But it's also the only way you can receive something different, perhaps better. And so that open mindedness, I know I have my <laughs> quarter <laughs> and, and I know I want to use it to enhance my life. I also know that it is not enough. And so I have to surrender to the opportunity of losing the quarter while also being open to the opportunity of gaining more than my quarter. So it is that type of illustration, how I look at a type of open mind. Mm, so there is trust. Um, open heart. I see trust in there. There's a trust, a receptiveness. And while you have your quarter or you know what you know, <laughs> you are also aware that is much more than what you have and what 
you already know. Wow. How have you reinvented yourself, Saban? I, I'm, I'm looking at life through stages, and uh, I'll say that yesterday I uh, had a book signing for my latest novel, and the nostalgia of being back in Detroit, my hometown, where I launched the book, but more, more importantly was I uh, visit the cemetery where both of my parents have been laid to rest, and this part that I'm I'm definitely a, an adult now. <laughs> my parents are no longer there. So I kind of look at my life through these stages, these stages where my parents instilled in my brother and myself that the world is bigger than Detroit. They had not traversed that world, but they gave us the best they could. But then, so there was this stage of value, work ethic being instilled. Then there was an, ex, I guess, an experiment stage, um, experimenting in terms of trying different things. I went to Hampton University away from Detroit, although I'd never been to Virginia. Uh, that courage to do that was something that my parents instilled, and then I exercised it. I, uh, I was a kindergarten teacher, which at the time in the state of Michigan, I don't think there were five African-American men that taught kindergarten. So the courage to act on those things. And so now this next stage of the reinvention is a type of certain confidence. So I'm not experimenting anymore. I have an idea of what works. And I also have a, a more acute sense of purpose in terms of giving back. Um, and as, to kind of go, go to an educator example, when they talk about young learners, sometimes young learners, like first, second, and third graders, they will achieve to impress mom and dad. And mom and dad will put the spelling test on the side of the refrigerator and, you know, they'll put stickers and they're happy. And so the learning experience is for someone else. And then there's a different part and it's different for everybody where there's a joy of learning. And that's different than earning a grade. And so I would say that I've moved from mom and dad to the joy of learning <laughs> stage. Uh, and that's a generalized you know, view of reinvention. Uh, as as a professional, I reinvented myself from being a teacher to a principal to a church administrator to a higher education professional. So yeah, I've had these progressive journeys. I'm enjoying this stage uh, as dad of teenage daughters. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> They're hilarious. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> uh, what a journey, right? What an experience that must be. How did you become an author? I enjoyed writing. I remember once in middle school, I actually had a rough time with the teacher and our relationship bonded have to write about our career, what we want to be when we grow up. And people would write, I want to be a firefighter. I want to be a doc. My story in the first person, as if I was uh, on my way to perform for the, the Johnny Carson show, I was the, trunk, the saxophonist in the band. So I wrote my account on my way to work. And so the different voice perspective is definitely me as a grown up. But I told that story in a unique way. That teacher, my parents, other people kind of supported the writing. Then there was a stage of learning. Uh, I've been in school much of my life. I've been a teacher. And so there's a responsibility to convey the message. There's some things I know. And then there's the medium. So I can't always teach in a classroom. What are some avenues for me to have a broader influence. And so that those kind of stimulated into the writing. My first book was more so of like a, a memoir for educators, but I was doing free teacher workshops. And since the workshop, it cost me money to prepare. I would sell this book as a way of recouping my losses. <laughs> um, that education consultant business was called Measurable Advancement. The shift or the reinvention from Measurable Advancement advancement to fielding books is that with my consulting company, writing was secondary. With fielding book, books, writing is primary. Uh, there's a particular influence on my, I guess, style or intent of writing. And there was a, um, a very celebrated, lauded constitutional scholar named Derek Bell. And uh, some years ago, uh, he, he's passed, but some years ago, he had a book called Faces at the Bottom of the Well. And, and it was a collection of essays and short stories. And the essays were very scholarly, very informative. But the short stories had a way of communicating complex ideas in a manner where non-students could receive them. 
And it sort of fits an adage that my dad said frequently growing up. And he would say that we should put the cookies on the bottom shelf where the babies can reach them. So all of this experience kind of gelled together. And so now as a fiction writer, although I write, I more so view myself as an artist who creates with words. And as the, the, the little nuance may not mean much to others, but it means something to me. Um, and so as an artist, I take this responsibility of telling um, African-American stories, my story, our stories, with the type of responsibility and maintaining the integrity of our history. So, for example, when maintaining the integrity um, if you ask a random person who Dr. Martin Luther King was, they would, in fact, say that he had a dream. And that's correct. It's also incomplete, almost trivial limitation of what his life is. So how can I, as a writer, as a responsible citizen, steward of the culture, convey the substance of our history forward in a way that's palpable for non-academic readers? And so that all of those things kind of gel together and led to this reinvention of myself as a writer. Wow. Um, do you think that writing can become a personal reinvention in itself or it can help us on the path of reinventing ourselves? I definitely do. And I, I, I see it in two ways, the craftsmanship or the technical delivery of the story and the deep personal places you have to go to tell the story. There's a certain surrender of vulnerability that comes with telling a rich story. And it may expose things that within us that we have to address before we can communicate them. So that's the internal part. And then the technical delivery, um, how do you tell the story? Uh, I, I spoke with a gentleman yesterday and he was telling me the premise for a story, a science fiction story, and it was marvelous. But it appealed to me as someone with an extensive background in the things that he was saying. If he was going to communicate that book to new readers, he may have to make that into several smaller books so that they can digest it and get to the big idea. Uh, so, there's, so, and so that writing, in terms of helping us grow, it forces us internally to face things, accept, acknowledge, be vulnerable with certain parts of our heart, and then the craft becoming better with us <laughs> to the story. So yes, I agree that writing does kind of open us up and help us grow. Yeah. What has been some challenges you faced in your personal reinvention, and how did you manage those challenges? Uh, there are, I, if I could sum it up, I'll use the challenge of knowing the timeliness of certain lessons or the time window. I grew up in a pretty religious, strict church, Christian church. And I grew up in Detroit during the time when it was the murder capital of the world. The, the structure and rigor of that church provide some parameters, some safe havens for my brother and myself to survive Detroit during this tumultuous time. It did, in fact, do that. It also instilled in us some core principle values. I wouldn't consider myself a theologian. Ogen, but as a lifelong learner, I've learned the limitations of what that church that provided structure to my childhood, it would be extremely constricting to me as an adult. What I had to learn is so that those lessons were for that time. And it, it would also be a waste of my energy to judge, be angry, otherwise be com have combative energy toward that when I just accept that that was the best thing for us at that stage of our life. And at this new stage, there are other things that are important. So I had to learn that all of, I guess, the good things in life, they have a time limit. And then I have to accept and recognize and move on. I think sometimes when we hold on to the past or try to make things continue to be as they were, it causes a type of internal discord and an intense dissatisfaction within our spirit. Um, speaking of um, religion and spirituality, God, who is God to you? I think God is a higher being, a controlling energy, um, the source of life. I think in different cultures, different circumstances, people have a comfort level 
with re- relating to God in certain familiar terms. If, the, if you want to call that the structure of a religion, because I have been a practicing Christian in the past, that does not prevent me from seeing the value in Islam and Buddhism and Hinduism and other different religions. Um, And to the fact that I have this, I guess, global understanding that we commune with the higher power in a way that's comfortable or familiar to us, I know it's inappropriate and wrong to impose the realities of my American Christian background onto someone else with a different set of experiences. And so the, I guess, the local (laughs) commune or relationship that I have with God. It's just my way of communing, but that isn't the way overall. And that as unique as I am as a human being, other unique human beings have a unique commune with God. So it has a lot of seminaries and similarities and then a lot of unique attributes for all of us. What would you say is the difference between religion and spirituality? There's a structure within religion that for a non-spiritual person could be like training wheels on a bike. They help (laughs) you learn how to ride. (laughs) Once you become an accomplished rider, those training wheels become an impediment. I'm going to come back to your question. I want to provide an illustration. This is an illustration I use a lot in life. And that is if you had a college graduate with numerous degrees and a five-year-old, and you gave them paint and you gave them a white canvas, a blank canvas, and told them to paint. Who would paint the most, the most creatively, the most freely, and have the most fun? <laughs> It'll be the kids. <laughs> the college graduate may actually ask you, what do you want me to paint? And so this accomplished learner, they're certified with numerous degrees, and they still don't know. They don't, they've learned a lot of stuff, but they lost the freedom to paint. And the five-year-old is painting. And so it reminds me of a, a, a parable, uh, I think it's a samurai parable that says, in the beginner's mind, there are many options, and in the expert's mind, there are mm, few. Wow. Yeah. So going back to religion and spirituality, I'm coming to find that once we get past the training wheel, uh, initial preliminary discipline structure of religion, that it, in fact, turns into a type of expert mind with limited <laughs> possibilities. But I think with spirituality, you, it maintains a type of beginner's mind and a type of openness to new ideas and new experiences and new perspectives. And so all of that is my different, <laughs> <laughs> different definitions of the yeah, two. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, it speaks to me, um, that's for sure. Talking about uh, prejudice, What would you say to someone who is dealing with unfair prejudices and frequent misunderstandings? I want to add to your question that I would be extremely sensitive to the context of our conversation. But to provide an answer, if the context was neutral and they asked for my help, um, I would, one, start from a place of empathy and try to hear them out and hear their expression of the prayer prejudice, um, how they described how it made them feel. Then I want to provide a different context because I definitely believe there's no value in getting into the blame game. I mean, there's an acknowledgement of responsibility, which I think is different than blame. I'm going to use an example from a student that I had. Um, This student had been one of my students. She was a high achiever. And when she got to graduate school, she felt that the professor was just too hard. I asked the student if for a week observed the professor, do you find the professor's behavior to be specific to you or are they an equal opportunity or pressure? So it helped that the student, the student reported back that the professor was indeed the equal opportunity butthole to everybody. <laughs> So it relieved some of the sting out of her feeling that it was a personal attack on her. So then we backtracked in terms of what is it that we need or that she needed from the professor at this moment of her life. And this professor, uh, she was a vet, vet, uh, animal science graduate student, and the professor was responsible for the laboratory hours. So all she needed was laboratory access and to submit good lab results. She didn't need 
for that pre- pressure to be the mentor to her that I already was. So we kind of changed the context and her expectation while acknowledging that we're not ex- saying that it's okay for that professor to be that way. But the most important thing is for her to get what she needs from that experience so that she can move forward. That helped her in that experience. Um, sometimes people that have been prejudged don't have the luxury of context. There's the immediacy of the moment. To put it in, uh, you, I, I, get, I was going to say African-American, but when we consider the number of civilians that have been hurt, maimed, or killed by the police, it may be an American phenomenon. It's definitely acute in minority neighborhoods. And so if they're being prejudged and this officer is there with his gun, out. You don't really have the time to be <laughs> understanding of the equal opportunity or there's an immediate need to survive, which is more important than the, the uh, maybe the knee jerk reaction to be right. So if the police unfairly pull, pull me over and assume that as an African-American man, I'm a threat to the community, my first responsibility is I need to think of how can I get home to my family. My debate with the officer in this context could lead to my death. And that does nobody any good. And even if the officer eventually says he was wrong, she was wrong, we've all lost. Um, So um, is there, for a person that's being prejudged, a well of understanding that helps them survive the moment of prejudice to live, to fight, to resolve a bigger issue, or in fact, just live long enough to be of service to those they love? Um, I'm not into senseless bravado that ends up with me dying and my children not having a dad and my wife not having a husband, although I will probably be pretty infuriated (laughs) in the circumstances, right? I still need to get home, and that would allow me the chance to do something about the being prejudged. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, Um, I like what you said about not taking everything personally because people do what they do, right? They are responsible for the content of their minds. We can control that. What you said is really true. We can fight for justice and we can do things to correct uh, the unfairness. That understanding is very important uh, that we have no control of changing people's minds. Unfortunately, I say. And, you know, I, I would like just to add on a bit. There are times when the lesson that we could model, teach, the benefits of it does not show up to some time later and may actually show up in a context where we don't see and or benefit from it. So I had this experience as a beginning teacher. I taught second grade. And uh, as my level of personal expectation was always higher than any professional evaluation I had. And my personal thing was I wanted every kid in my class to read at a third grade level when they left. One of the students could not read at all when he arrived. When he left my class, he was reading at a first grade level. At that time, I thought I was a failure <laughs> because I had missed my goal. And it took some some intervention from some pretty good mentors to help me see that I helped this kid grow. Well, he, he's never going to get on a third grade reading level if he didn't have this foundation that I provided. So while it was well intended to have this high expectation, I had to temper it with his reality and accept that the outcome was different than what I planned. So if I was going back, taking that type of acceptance into a circumstance where I'm prejudged against uh, or treated unfairly, that person and their perspective as to why they are treating me this way, they may only learn that it was inappropriate after the incident with me, but they never learn it if they don't have this incident with me. That doesn't mean I willingly want to be prejudged. Just again. to teach that lesson, right? <laughs> of understanding. Yeah, I don't want to teach that lesson, but I have to understand that, you know, maybe they won't know until to, after this happens. So it, it's an extension of, um, again, not taking the yeah, things personal. I like that, Sabin. I like that a lot. Yeah. Wow. Just the thought of it is just enlightening. It's great. Let me ask you some questions about life in general. Um, health. They, I have like a lot of them here. This is outside of the subject we have been talking about um, on reinvention. Do you want to say anything else about reinvention before we move on to unrelated subjects? Yeah, I'm going to model reinvention and 
be open and willing to the next direction you take the conversation. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. You're bringing this to practice right here, right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's fun. So my first question to you with that in mind is, if life had one purpose for us, one purpose only, what would that be in your opinion? Well, I would say that that answer has evolved or been reinvented. Um, currently, the potency value of playing it forward seems to be a real lesson that I'm really understanding now. I, well, I knew it logically, like you could read something in the book and know it logically. As a dad, the value of teaching, modeling for my daughters to continue life to the question, the purpose of us is to sustain life and continue it going forward. And to and in doing that, we have to grow beyond perhaps some human limiting conditions. So for example, a human li limiting condition could be that when my parents die, that they are gone forever. An expanded view of paying it forward is this notion of celestial beings, angels, um, people watching over or reincarnation, however that goes. Their energy still exists and sometimes is manifest through me and my brother and shows up in my kids. So those lessons and sacrifices that they made, the sacrifices they made for me, the lessons they provided for me, I have to pay it forward in a new context for my children, my model it with my wife, my students, and then they, they in fact, carry it forward um so there is a so this purpose of life thing is kind of an understanding that i am a part of a larger chain of sequence if that makes sense <laughs> and that i have a, a role in my window of time in this form to move things forward and um if that changes if you <laughs> you interview me in five years, maybe it'll yeah. be a little. <laughs> like, I'll be asking you again the same question. That's where I am today. <laughs> I'll make sure to ask you the same questions. <laughs> They're all recorded so we, we can track. <laughs> okay. My next question is, uh, what is your definition of love? I, I In my latest novel, Compared to What, one of the scenes is a mother parenting her adult son through a relationship snafu he's run into. And I think in contemporary American society, the, mis the limited perception of love is some type of possession. Um, I love you. You are mine. Although I refer to my children, they are our children. They are God's gift that I have an accountability for in this context, but they are ours. And so love or genuine love is beyond possession. Possession is an immature expression of love, even though it may come from a, you know, a, a well-meaning place. And so this love has a type of acceptance. It has a type of exchange, um, but maybe a little more nuanced than a give and a take. But there's an exchange there. And in this, this acceptance, this exchange, we become better. So this love is a it's an action verb. It's a phenomenon that's ongoing. And, and when it's functioning in a healthy capacity, there's an I guess an enriching phenomenon within the spirit. When it's happening in an inappropriate manner, there's a constriction, limitations that's imposed on the spirit. I wish that we didn't have sad examples like this, but a sad example of immature, inappropriate love would be perpetrator of domestic violence. Their immature, inappropriate expression of love is one of containment. And if something goes against it, they're going to rebel and fight against it. So while in their heart, they may have intense feeling for the other, they have not matured to the type of acceptance, exchange, and enriching. They're attempting to contain things and keep them as, as they can be seen in their limiting way. So there's a, I mean, a, so I guess love has many forms of expression. It's a very dynamic thing, but it can be limited and misconstrued. Yes, very much. Hmm. Yeah. How do you define success? Um, I, I'm going to provide an old example and a newer example. <laughs> as a mm. younger man, as a 
citizen in Western society. I did not learn this from my parents. I picked it up from the outside world. I thought success was the attainment of things. <laughs> you know, I got a degree. I got a car. I make this salary. These external definition, these things that are out there, I thought was success. Um, with the more life experience, a better understanding of what I was taught by elders who care, success morphs and changes and it's situational, but it has this notion of growth and learning, growth, learning, and then functioning. And uh, I wish I had a better word than higher plane because higher tends to have this higher, lower, good, bad connotation. And I don't mean that. But I do mean in a, 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 a type of greater responsibility arena. Uh, so success, um, so some people would say that my success as a professional was that as a younger man, I had a master's degree at 22. That was cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> it had some benefits. And it, it was definitely a testimony to my parents' sacrifice. But the success came. And sharing those lessons that I learned to be a master teacher with the students. So the exercising of what I learned. And so then when I exercise, it, uh, that now I'm getting, I'm kind of blurring the line between success and love. Because there's an acceptance of the responsibility that I owe because of what was given to me. There was an exchange in that I brought my expertise to the learning environment. But I also received from the mentor teachers, from the students, and from their parents. And then it pushed me to this, I'm back to this word higher. I got to get a better word. (laughs) (laughs) This this other realm, this more enriched realm of now I'm successful. I'm a better teacher. I'm a better person. That's a kind of dynamic definition for success. But it's definitely beyond the external acquisition of things. It is not that at all. (laughs) Right. Wow. I really like that. Yeah, becoming a better person and sharing that with others. That's the being in the definition of success. That's beautiful. You know, I, I want to take that and I'm going to go back to my perception of Miles Davis because I okay. obviously never met the man. <laughs> but one of the things that stood out to me in his Kind of Blue album, he recruited John Coltrane and uh, Cannonball Adderley. Gil Evans plays a role. And all of these guys are automatically, I mean, they are phenomenal musicians in their own right. With this recording, Miles chose to be with other greats, not be that I'm Miles and the rest of y'all. No, it's all of us are extremely talented and together we'll have a collective energy that creates a better music, a better sound. Um, And so at that type of reinvention showed up in what they call his great bands and years later with Herbie Hancock and uh, Wayne Shorter, those guys. And so this willingness to exchange and participate with other extraordinary beings, not be the big fish in a small pond, but all of us bring something unique to the table. So there's a perspective that comes with that. Um, Wow. I love that. The idea of collaboration, right? Working together. Yes, that's really precious. What was the hardest lesson to learn about yourself? The hardest lesson I had to learn about myself was that being insecure about my hearing disability, recognizing that perceived setback, perceived flaw, was in fact one of the most dominant factors into my overall success as a human being because it gave me the adaptive behaviors, just the empathy, the equipment, understanding to try. So there, that, I'm coming back to acceptance. Another type of acceptance that was equally challenging was really uh, acceptance, but a more accurate word is discernment. Everybody doesn't want to win. Or win look, winning looks different for everyone else. And so I could desperately want something for someone. But if that's not what they want, I have to accept that and move on, not try to beat them over the head and make them see it my way. As now, professionally, what happens is um, I was a, uh, an assistant principal when I was 26. And that part of me that wanted to listen to other people's perspectives so that we collectively could make a great choice made me appear indecisive. And I guess uh, 
the American tradition. We want John Wayne as our leader. We want to say, hey, we're going this way and to hell with everything else. And I didn't want to be that kind of leader. And so I wish I had a non-judgmental word. Let's say people with limited life experiences saddled me with this notion of being indecisive. But what really what I was trying to do was hear everybody's points of view so we could move forward. And so that discernment, that discernment when I have to just as a leader or as a human being, when I have to pull the trigger or make things go versus the appropriate, the discernment to know this is a time to get everybody involved. I haven't mastered that one yet, but I'm I'm a willing <laughs> student. <laughs> um, yeah, I like that principle. That's um, right along those lines. Um, no, wisdom, I think, has to do a lot with wisdom, natural wisdom of what life is about, what we are about, just walking together. I like that a lot. Um, what is to be strong, Sabin? Um, from a woman's or man's perspective, from a man's perspective in this case, but do you think it's different from women and men? I, I mentioned being a lifelong learner. <laughs> and in this learning, um, particularly in the last 15 years, the expanded view of the limitations of gender roles, right? I, I grew up in a hyper-masculine era, which has some cool points, but could have some ugly prejudice type downside too and how it perceived gays or people that express their gender expression differently so although i know that there are gender roles and <laughs> the strength actually isn't gender exclusive i'll put it that way i'll tell you a, a very recent phenomenon um, there's a transition happening at my place of employment the former supervisor gave me a task that i was not good at and I've had a deal of success with some things that people didn't think I could achieve. And this thing that appears easy, I, I didn't know what I was doing. And furthermore, there are people that can do it better. Admitting that I couldn't do it was a confrontation to my ego because nobody wants to say they're hiring to this particular task is beyond their skill set. I am in the midst of experiencing that what it did is that it allowed people to see me another way and it allowed other people who had been overlooked a chance to shine with an opportunity that they didn't have before. So I'm finding strength. It's not, you know, a Herculean perception of a guy who can bench press boulders and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but the a, a type of action that has the greatest benefit at a given time. So um, some, some years ago, I went through a reorganization on a job and one of the elders told me, he said, when the storms of life come, he said, you could be the oak tree or you could be the palm tree, but there's only one standing after the storm. Palm trees and oak trees are, well, while they're trees, <laughs> they, they are very different, I guess. I'm not a scientist, so genetically they're different. And so the oak tree has this type of rigidity, this type of strength and this rootedness. Um, and it serves a purpose. It has value, but it's different if you're, then, if you're going to stand after the storm. And so if I have this responsibility to myself, to my wife, my kids, my community, then I need to be able to persevere through storm. So strength comes with a type of perseverance, adjustment, and flexibility, not rigidity. Well said. Yeah, well, well said. Flexibility, open-mindedness, right. What is to be true to yourself? Are you true to yourself? <laughs> um, and I'm coming back to this notion of acceptance, <laughs> yeah. accepting that this sense of self is evolving and changing. I know this is not exclusive to myself, and so I'm, I'm talking about myself, but in a general sense to others. I think sometimes when people make it out of, survive through marginalized backgrounds, that there can become a type of survivor's guilt. Very recently, my brother and I, again, we were raised in Detroit, a pair of brothers, and the next block over on our street was a pair of brothers. One of them was murdered about a month ago, and the other one is doing life in prison. So what was it that made myself and Damon, our story so unique that we would have these opportunities in life and they didn't? While I don't know about the choices they made, why they made, I personally had to move beyond 
feeling bad. So then it showed up professionally and that my dad worked at a factory. My mom was a nurse. So the core values I learned as a child were blue collar working class values. My professional accomplishment lends itself to more white collar environments. When I was in a circumstance, uh, I was a chief operating officer of this mega church and I was attempting to have a moment of empathy with the underperforming employee. And in the midst of our conversation, I realized that while he and I share similar backgrounds, he does not see me as one of them he, or one of us. He sees me as one of them, separate from his reality, even though maybe our values were the same. And so then I felt I felt cast out, <laughs> yeah, right. not by him personally, but kind of what it represented. And then it also switched in that because I had those blue collar leanings and premonitions or work ethic that in white collar environments, I was, I felt like an odd man. But what I've come to understand is that in loving myself and accepting myself is that in many manifestations, I am a bridge between two very different dynamics. And one side understands the other through me. Um, And so my role is, uh, and not like I'm the ambassador spokesperson (laughs) and all be all say all these things but it's to model for one group what they wouldn't have access to in the other group and i'm serving maybe a type of spokesperson yeah and so then and this duality of my life and maybe that duality is an extension of what du bois talked about to be both of african origin and an american citizenship, uh, there's a type of duality, but this acceptance of the duality and then a type of confidence, empowerment, and functioning in this way is my current (laughs) evolved sense of self-love. Yeah, I like that too. Yeah, being this agent, the bridge you said, and creating this balance. Um, Yeah, that takes a lot of self-knowledge and um, wisdom. So my next question is, if you knew you would die soon, what would you change about your life? What would you do differently? I don't think I would do much differently. Uh, I mentioned earlier that I did a book signing event in Detroit. And there's a notion that there were people there that I may never see again. But those people were there. They already know that I love them. And I and I know that they love me. That's why they took the chance out of their time, their day to be there. Um, their support for my art, my company, is an expression of their love. So if I were to die tomorrow, I wouldn't have to spend my day calling each of them to say, hey, you know, I love you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because I, I've learned to ex- ex- see or recognize expressions of love. Um, there's a type of consistency that I like to model for my kids and, and my home. I guess if there was one thing on a very surface level I would set up is that I would actually take the time and print all of the passwords so that my wife could navigate <laughs> my financial stuff. She knows it. She's on record. That is funny. <laughs> but like if I were dead tomorrow, she would have to go to the bank. It would not log in. <laughs> and, it, and it's something we t- we talked about. It. <laughs> no, it's not. You care about their safety, their health, and their well-being. Yeah. The agreement was, to add a bit of humor to it, the agreement word was that we were going to print out all <laughs> of our passwords, where they go and stuff, okay. and then seal them in an envelope and just put the envelope in the safe <laughs> where we keep you know, our important documents. And so if something happened, just open the envelope, access all the passwords, right? <laughs> and, and keep updating, right? Just in case we change the passwords. <laughs> yeah, they keep updating. <laughs> that is funny that you think. That you'd think about them. Yeah, that's true. So, and, but it's, it's an extension of caring for them. So, you know, I do, I do not I have a will. I do have all beneficiaries and life insurance and types accounts set up. And my wife is on and she knows who to call and that type of stuff. Um, so there's a sense of providing for them, although I'm not here personally. So the change would be because the things are already in place to provide for them. I guess the change, I would probably make that path a little smoother. <laughs> But that is so interesting. My wife, children, students, everybody knows their love. I know that they have demonstrated their love to me. I have, uh, and I'm going to go back to that kid who finished my class reading at a first grade level. That real, that experience as the perspective was shaped for me by one of the mentor teachers there. 
really helped me look at life a lot in terms of our intention and what really happened and how we discern whether or not that was good or bad or successful. So um, I know that I've done the best that I could. Or the, I used to play sports, so the football coach would say, did I leave it all on the field? <laughs> <laughs> That's good, too. Very good. Yeah, very good. <laughs> yeah, I, I left it all on the field every day. And another joke is I probably would eat more chocolate <laughs> if I knew it. I don't have to get on the scale tomorrow. I'll get a mention. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a joke. You're just telling the truth right here, right now. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Oh, man, that's funny because I don't think about those. Yeah, like rarely somebody answers with this level of, of practicality. You know, I would make sure my wife and my kids, they will be fine. I'll give them the passwords or whatever. That is like, that's love. Yeah, that's profound love. And that so, seems so practical, right? Instead of being hugging them, kissing them all day. So do you believe in life after death? And if you do, what kind of life? I am an active student in that learning process. So from the heart and even from a level of logic, yes, I do believe in life after death. How it manifests itself may be the thing that I'm learning now. As a child growing up, my mom is one of five. Her dad was the oldest of 13. I never met my grandfather's father, uh, Willie Quince. Willie Quince died a year before I was born. Uh, as a child, um, people said I bore a strong resemblance to him, he, the way he walked, some of his ideas. Am I Willie reincarnated? <laughs> That'd be pretty cool, right? <laughs> right. That'd be um, interesting. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, and is, is some of Willie's life energy in me? I definitely believe so. Um, but in the sense that it's, um, it's hard to comprehend, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not so. Um, so I, I want to shift gears just for, for example's sake. People who circumstances are such that they are living hand to mouth, they're not sure where their next meal is coming from, they really don't understand. The value of investing money is not real to them because their circumstances prevent them from seeing it. That does not mean that investing money is not a good thing. It just means that in their circumstances, they can't see it. So in my circumstances, in this human form, I can't see how the life energy re-manifests, but I earnestly believe that it does. That's going to be fun to learn. Yeah, right. So that's a belief for you. Do you wish for a life, some kind of life after death? Okay, this is not a direct answer, but um, it's a life lesson that I learned from my dad. And I'm going to bring it back to the answer. I grew up with the value of humility and humility does have great value. And if misconstrued, it can be limited. As a fourth or fifth grader, I forget how old I was. I made the honor roll. My dad told me, I get anything I want. I had a sense frame of reference of my parents' financial understand circumstances. So I didn't want to be inappropriate and ask for too much. So I asked for two G.I. Joe action figures. Now, on a great day, I got one. So to get two was a 100% improvement from what I ever experienced. I didn't think it could get any better than that. So I asked for two. I got two. Um, on the drive home, my dad said, well, I'm glad that's all you asked for. I was going to get you to G.I. Joe headquarters. And I felt so defeated. But I'm bringing that back to this notion of life after death, after life, after the deterioration of this physical manifest, this current arrangement of atoms, molecular, that I call my body. <laughs> Is there life after that? I, I, again, I do believe so. How would it look? I'm afraid any words I would say would only be two G.I. Joes and it wouldn't be the, <laughs> wouldn't be the headquarters. All right. <laughs> so. True. So let's leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my, my last, last question to you is, what are three things about life you know for sure? Uh, I think that there's a direct correlation between living, learning, and loving. There are people that are alive in terms of breathing, but they are not living. And I don't mean to say that about them in a judgmental way. 
And these, some of these imposed boundaries on their life is in response to adversity they have faced. But when they start imposing these constrictions on their life, they stop learning of new ways to grow beyond that. And their world becomes smaller until it suffocates the life out of them. And I mean that in a illustrative way, not in a way to judge people who are suffering from, you know, life, health challenges. And I wouldn't want to cheapen or demean that in any way. But in, 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 in an illustrative way, how is it that some people both are di- two people are diagnosed with the same illness and one is able to overcome and the other one is not? Well, the health, health insurance may factor. Oh, <laughs> well, yeah, that. That, that helps, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Their outlook on life is a factor. And if they have an outlook that I, I don't want to say I'm going to beat this, but I can live, I can have a life in a new form. There's a type of learning that goes into recreating this new person. So many years ago when the when the actor Christopher Reeve suffered the injury, you know, he was Superman in one type of manifestation, right? But he lived a quality life in a different form for many years later. And of course, there was a type of grief over how he knew himself before. And an acceptance of who he is now and then how he can live forward. So and, I, and I'm using him in illustrative in terms of this change to one's physical stature doesn't mean that you uh, have to stop living. I hope that makes sense as an answer. <laughs> it does very much. I love the way you connect living, learning and loving. Would that be the answer? Yeah. Wow. That's sure. the answer. Yeah. Uh, learning. I love the way you apply learning, just learning about yourself, about life, becoming a better person and recreating yourself yeah, to face the challenges of life. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Sabin. Uh, what a great conversation. I really appreciate that. You're welcome. I appreciate sharing the opportunity to share. All right. Thank you. Where can we find more information about you, your work, your books, services, future projects? Uh, my website is uh, sabinprentice.com, S-A-B-I-N-P-R-E-N-T-I-S.com. Uh, just a quick or uh, two quick footnotes. Uh, Prentice is my middle name. Um, I, I am an academic scholar by trade, so I will write nonfiction as Sabin Duncan. Dr. Duncan does this research. Saving Prentice is me as, as an artist. That's my artist's voice. The other footnote is that I, in working with the team yesterday, my creative team yesterday, I don't talk about myself enough. That's <laughs> what <laughs> they say. <laughs> talk about these perspectives, but I don't share. So there are some inclinations about me. They joke that they have to pull it out of me because um, I, I, perhaps the biggest paradox about me is that I have this hearing impairment But I'm a great listener and I love to listen to other people's story more than telling my own. But yeah, SavingPrentice.com. I'm on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter, Saving Prentice. And these platforms for sharing our lives, I talk about all these different books I'm reading. (laughs) (laughs) um, But that's where I can be connected to. (laughs) I really appreciate your presence uh, today. Thank you so much again. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Bye for now. Bye bye. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Sabin Prentice, please visit his website, sabinprentice.com. S A B I N. P R E N T I S dot com. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. I want to thank the Patreon members Lawrence McGrath, Mark Basden, Terry Clayton, and Aiden Bigrock. Thank you again for listening, and bye for now.